Kia ora and welcome back. In this video we're going to start looking at a special kind of mapping called a homomorphism. We've met something similar to these when we studied isomorphisms, but homo homomorphisms, even though in some ways they're quite similar, they serve quite a different purpose. It's a tool that we're going to develop that lets us probe how a group behaves by sort of breaking it down into sort of higher level behavior. So we'll start by just sort of defining what homomorphisms are and working through some properties of them just to get comfortable with the actual definition and then we'll have an explore of how, they use, how they're actually used in subsequent videos. So here's our definition. A homomorphism phi from a group G to another group G bar is a mapping from G into, not onto, it's a subtle but important difference, into G bar that preserves the group operation, i.e. phi of AB equals phi of A phi of B for all AB in our group G. Okay, so it looks very similar to the definition of an isomorphism, except that we've missed out the one-to-one -one and onto parts. Okay, so when we're doing homomorphisms from a group to another group, we are not concerned with the groups being the same size. The only thing that matters is that the operation preserves uh, the group operation. So if you compose elements AB before doing phi, you get the same thing as passing AB through phi first and then composing them in G bar afterwards. All right, so the fact that we don't need it to be one-to-one -one and onto means that there are other things that can happen. For example, we are allowed to have two elements in G mapping to the same element in G bar. Okay, so we've got a little bit more terminology we need to introduce so that we can deal with things like this. Okay, so it turns out the concept that helps us make sense of this is the idea of a kernel. So the kernel of a homomorphism is, a, is the set of all elements in a group that map to the identity of the other group. So we denote it capital K, so kernel, cur for kernel, phi is just the set of all x's in G such that phi of x is equal to the identity. Okay, so these are the two sort of new definitions that we need to be able to become familiar with. So let's just test this out a little bit on some examples just to start to get a bit of a feeling how homomorphisms work. So first off, every isomorphism preserves a group operation, so all isomorphisms are also homomorphisms. So example number one, an isomorphism is a homomorphism. Number two, let's consider um, phi mapping n by n invertible matrices with real entries onto the group of non-zero real numbers under multiplication. Uh, defined by phi of a matrix A equals the determinant of A. Is this a homomorphism? Well, all we need to check is that it preserves the group operation. So phi of AB here is equal to debt AB. And we know that the determinant of the product of two matrices is just the product of the determinants. So you can see that that gives us debt A, debt B, which gives us 5A times 5B in the real numbers. Okay, so that's a homomorphism because it preserves the group operation. What is the kernel? Well, let's just see if we can translate the language. The kernel of our operation phi here is the set of all X and G, so the set of all matrices A in G, L, N, R, such that phi of x, so such that debt a is equal to the identity, which in the non-zero reals under multiplication is 1. Okay, so it's the set of all matrices with determinant 1, which is just the special linear group of n by n matrices with real entries. Okay, so that's quite nice. So there's a, an easy to uh, sort of grasp example. Let's do another one. Um, let's take our function phi from the integers onto zn defined by phi of m is equal to m mod n. Okay, so we're going from the integers to zn and just by taking the number mod n what is the kernel of phi here? Okay, for, well, first off, we should test, test its operation preserve, preserving. So phi of x plus y equals x plus y mod n equals, oh, you can see that's going to work, 
5x plus 5y mod in. Okay, it's all, it all works nicely. And so what is the kernel of this one? Well, it's all the things. The kernel of phi is the set of all integers in z such that x mod n is equal to 0. 0 is the identity of zn. And so that just equals all the multiples of n. So we can write that nicely as uh, the cyclic subgroup generated by n. And finally, we're kind of also used to these things in a linear algebra setting, even though we haven't been calling them homomorphisms. So last example from linear algebra. If we have we have Rm and Rn, these are vector spaces, and also groups under addition. And then we have a linear transformation. T, which takes Rm onto or into Rn, defined by T of x equals Ax. Remember, linear transformations are always defined by matrices on these spaces, is a homomorphism. Why is that? Well, T of x plus y equals a x plus y equals a x plus a y equals t of x plus t of y and what is the kernel of this well you may even have had it defined to you as the kernel this the words of the kernel of t is the set of all x in uh, m such that ax equals the identity, which is 0 for rn, because we're dealing with the vectors as with additively, with 0 being the identity. So it just equals the null space of the matrix A, which you may even have had called the kernel of A, depending on what book you used. Okay, so linear transformations on vector spaces, they're also homomorphisms. So you can see this is a much larger class of things than isomorphisms because isomorphisms tell us basically that two groups are essentially the same thing. Homomorphisms are a special kind of mapping between groups that doesn't convey that same information. So it's sort of philosophically a different type of beast. So for the second half of this video, we're going to look at our homomorphisms and look at properties of individual elements under homomorphisms, much like we did with the isomorphisms and also like we did with isomorphisms. I'll prove some of these and I'll leave some of them as exercises for you guys to do. So the first one, so we've got phi being a homo homomorphism from G to G bar. Um, we've got G being an element of G, if we need to refer to that. And the groups G and G bar have identities E and E bar. So the first one is that the phi takes the identity of G to the identity of G bar. And for this one, I'll leave the proof as an exercise. It works the same way as proving this exercise for isomorphisms, so we'll just leave that one out. Similarly, the second one works directly from the operation preservation property. So phi of G to the N is equal to phi of g, or to the power of n. Okay, and likewise, I'm not going to prove that one. It follows directly from operation preservation. Okay, third property. If the order of g is finite, then if it was an isomorphism, then the order of phi of g would be the same thing. But for a homomorphism, it's a little bit different. The order of phi of g divides the order of g. Okay, this one we will need to take a bit of a closer look at. But it's not all that tricky. So let's let's see what happens. So we'll let the order of let's just let the order of g equal n. 
then quite clearly that means that g to the n is the identity. And we know that e bar is phi of e, which is therefore phi of g to the n, which is therefore phi of g to the n. And all we can say here, because phi of g to the power of n is the identity, we know that is some multiple uh, of the order of phi of g. So hence, the order of phi of g divides n. We can't say anything stronger than that. Okay, property number four. The kernel is a subgroup of g. Okay, so let's just do our one-step subgroup test here. So first off, we know that the identity maps the identity. So the identity is a member of the kernel of phi. Remember, the kernel is the set of all things that map to the identity of g bar. So clearly the identity does. That's property number one. So the, our kernel is non-empty all the time. Um, this is like the trivial solution to a linear system is also, uh, when you're looking at null spaces and things. So this is non-empty. which means we're allowed to employ any of our subgroup tests we like. That's the condition. So we'll do the standard one step one. If A and B are in the kernel of phi, let's look at phi of A, B inverse. And if that's equal to the identity, then A, B inverse is in the kernel, and that satisfies the one step subgroup test. So by operation preservation, that's phi of A, phi of B inverse, Okay, and phi of b inverse is, is phi of b inverse. That's because if you just do put take b, b inverse, pass that through phi, use operation preservation, and you get that that one holds. Um, so that means overall we get e, e inverse equals, or e bar, sorry, e bar inverse is just e bar. Hence... AB inverse is in the kernel, and the kernel is thus a subgroup of G. Okay, so our next property is phi of A equals phi of B, if and only if um, the, the cosets A kernel phi and B kernel phi are the same thing. Let's have a look at how that one works. We'll prove one direction, and the other direction sort of follows by the same kind of logic. So we'll assume phi of a equals phi of b. Then if we then go ahead and multiply on the left by phi of b inverse, is the identity, which implies phi of b inverse, phi of a equals the identity, which means we can combine them together, phi of b inverse a and hence b inverse a is in the kernel. It then follows, using our standard coset rules, multiplying both things across, if what well, follows, that a kernel phi equals b kernel phi by standard coset properties. Right, the other direction works the same kind of way, so I'm not going to do that. Um, other direction, similar reasoning. Okay, that's assuming a kernel phi equals b kernel phi. Work backwards, essentially follow the same kind of logic back the other direction, and you'll get the same thing. So other direction, similar. All right, one more property to do. And this is probably one of the more important ones. Um, if an element g is mapped to g prime, 
then phi inverse of g prime. This is not this is not an inverse map in the conventional sense because we can have multiple things mapping to g prime. So this is called the pre-image of g prime. Okay, the set of all things that map to g prime is just equal to g kernel phi. Okay, so the kernel the kernel is involved uh, in all of these things, and the cosets of the kernel are all all mapped to the same object. Okay, so that's the important thing: cosets of a kernel all map to the same thing in g bar. Okay, so first we'll show that. It's contained within. So phi inverse or the pre-image of G prime is contained within our kernel. So we'll take an element, uh, an arbitrary element of that. So let X be an element of our pre-image. Then, if that's the case, phi of X equals g prime which equals 5 g and therefore by our previous property property 5 and hence g kernel phi equals x kernel phi and thus x is an element of g kernel phi as required And now we'll show the other statement. So we've shown that the pre-image is contained within G kernel phi. Now we'll show that the coset is contained within the pre-image, and that will establish that the two sets are equal. So now show that G kernel phi is contained within the pre-image of G prime. So it's a standard trick for showing the two sets equal. Show that each one is contained in the other one put it together and we can then establish that the two sets are equal. So now we've got to choose an, an arbitrary element of g kernel phi and show that it's in the pre-image. So how do we do that? Well let's choose something arbitrary from the kernel so that k be a member of the kernel of phi then gk is a member of g kernel phi And now we've got to show that it's in the pre-image, i.e. that it maps to G prime. And phi of GK equals 5G, 5K, operation preserving property of homomorphisms, equals G prime E bar, which just equals G prime. Thus, G kernel phi is contained within the pre-image phi inverse of G prime, and hence the two sets are equal. Equals. Okay, so that's probably a good place to leave this, but this is really a really important one because it means that the kernel of the homomorphism is a very important subgroup because the cosets of it all map to individual elements of the group that the homomorphism is targeting. So if we break up our partition our group into pieces, uh, which are cosets of the kernel, these are each piece going to map to one element each of our group. So it's like we're taking, we're splitting our, partitioning our group G into a bunch of pieces, and those pieces are going to be, uh, we'll find out that they're going to be a subgroup of our G bar. But we'll look at that kind of thing in the next video. That's enough for now, so we'll catch you in the next one. See you later.